31. And I'm gonna go ahead and call to order the meeting of the Bloomington, the city of Bloomington Township. <laughs> uh, and if everyone could stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance, 31. And I'm gonna go ahead and call to order the meeting of the Bloomington, city of Bloomington Township. <laughs> Uh, and if everyone, Madam Clerk, could you please go ahead and call? The, are we okay? Okay. Madam Clerk, could you please go ahead and call the roll? All right, we have Trustee Bolin. Oh, here. Trustee Montney? Here. Trustee Emig? Here. Trustee Becker? Here. Trustee Ward? Here. Trustee Crable? Here. Trustee Crumpler? Here. Trustee Milowombe? Here. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Is there anyone who would like to remove anything on the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Okay, so moved by uh, Trustee. I'll Strigo, second. Second by Trustee Crumpler. Um, I think we get to vote now, right? Electronically? Yep, you should have a, an electronic. Oh. Okay, mine says saved. This is my first time doing this. And it looks like I'm just missing uh, Trustee Bolin and Trustee Ward. You might need to refresh. And we got it. Okay, awesome. The consent agenda passes. There are no names to announce. Uh, next item on the agenda is a presentation of the annual treasurer's report um, for April 1, 2020 to March 31st, 2020. Uh, and it is recommended acceptance of the, the annual treasurer's report. Is there a presentation on this? Uh, it's just to put on file? Okay, okay. All right, sounds good. Uh, do we need a motion, Madam Clerk? Okay. Is there a motion to uh, accept the uh, the treasurer report? I'll make that motion. Okay, motion by Trustee Bolin, second by Trustee Becker. If you can go ahead and vote. Okay, the item passes, there are no nays to announce. Uh, next item on the agenda is reports by elected officials, starting with Township Supervisor Deb Skilrig. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So I know that you were probably more interested in discussing the, um, the way that township could potentially help with uh, mold remediation, you know, those issues. Uh, I thought we could just have a little bit of a discussion. Certainly nothing can be voted on at this point because there's no agenda item, but um, township is, uh, Township guidelines for emergency assistance and dental assistance are set, basically, federal courts back in the 90s had set us up so that we had to have consistency amongst all townships when it came to how to, um, how to handle 
general assistance and, and then emergency assistance is an optional program, but it follows the same guidelines as the general assistance. And so those guidelines are pretty much set. We can't pull any funds from that to do any of the work in this at all. We do have the CERP program, but that CERP program is um, a COVID response and based on um, the st Illinois statutes, 305 ILCS uh, 5, 6 dash, let's see here, <laughs> 5, 6, 6 through 9 from chapter 23, par 6 dash 9. And it's basically saying that we can set up a program like that if it's declared um, a, a pandemic or an emergency what is the word I'm trying to use? Major disaster. That's what I'm trying to use. Major disaster, if the president declares that on a national level, for, and it has to be within an area that he has declared. And so that's related, and that's why the CERP program is related to COVID. Mold remediation is something outside of the, of the scope of what townships were meant to do. However, I, I did propose an option to, and I've talked to Bill, Billy Tyus earlier today, but I did propose an option and actually attorney, your corporate counsel knows this too, is that um, if there was a way of moving the CDBG funds to use for the mold remediation, zero out those dollars, we could start using our SERP because we're the payer of last resort for any rental assistance, emergency assistance, uh, you know, any of the basic maintenance needs, utilities and all that. So I, I believe that Billy doesn't think that we can do, you, you can do that at the city because they're designated for COVID. So I don't know the exact answers totally on that, what, what's really true on that or not. Um, so I just want to offer our services at Township for any financial, um, processing of application administrative services for the financial side of it, we know nothing about remediation and mold issues and contracting out that kind of thing, but we certainly could help you out with um, the administration part of it from a financial perspective, if those guidelines are set and, and explained to us what those guidelines would be. Any questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, I guess I'm going to ask about assessment or uh, claims adjusters, you know, come in and decide was this mold there before or after the storm, that kind of thing. So who or how would that um, be processed? That, that couldn't be processed from township. We have no knowledge of that. Okay. It would have to be processed at the city somehow. And all we would be doing is making sure that somebody's eligible from an income point of view. Okay. We just don't have that kind of background. Our case managers are exceptional at doing the financial side of that and, and assessing the, the need uh, from a financial perspective and you know getting all the eligibility criteria out of the way. But when it comes to that, there's just, mm -hmm. I, I don't see how we can help in that. Sure, regard. thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Council Member, uh, Trustee Crumpler. Um, thank you, Deb. I just had a, a quick question. Um, I was looking, you know, at that that that, that four hundred thousand dollars that mm -hmm. I believe is emergency relief fund, and, mm -hmm. and I and I appreciate, you know, you 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 know, bringing that for us. It, it, I'm wondering, is is there any possibility that that money could be repurposed, certainly under limited circumstances? You know, not not just you know to support families that have been impacted by flooding. Is there any way that that, that I know what you're saying yeah. and. Um, the, the issue is, is you're taking township and the scope of how township works okay. from consistency among all of Illinois. And we're, you're, you would put us into a position that um, is beyond our authority at township to do. Okay. Um, I believe you have the ability to do that. I just don't feel that it's it's unprecedented in all of Illinois okay. to do it, but I believe you as the board have probably authorized, you can authorize the money to go there, but it's not gonna go very far. And then you take away from our ability to serve how we're supposed to serve, because you're taking that money away from 
the population of individuals to serve them for basic maintenance needs. Okay. So remediation is a very costly thing. I understand. And yeah. what we have at Township has to serve public aid capacity and you know the people that we serve. We can't run out of funds at Township or we go bankrupt if we don't help everybody that needs to be served. Uh, but then we go to the state. I understand. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? So just I, my own curiosity, you know, and I'm, mm -hmm. you know, a new council member trying to figure a lot of things out. So there have been six months or a year when COVID finally subsides, we hope. Yeah. Um, what then? I mean, is there a plan for that? For that it's, you know, is, there, is there a plan for those funds? Do they just stay there? I, for I think that I don't know the answer to that right at the moment. We're not sure how long this COVID will last okay. and how we are going to assess, you know, eligibility for COVID as the next years come up. Mm -hmm. So the presumption is, is that that money will be used in the next six months to a year because okay. everything's been delayed because of um, employment insurance and, and um, eviction moratorium. Disconnects sure. have been avoided. We are picking up in business quite a bit. Just today, we've we've been extremely busy with our general assistants looking for rent and utilities. And so we have to remember not to exhaust those funds too early. So. Um, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you for the, the clarifications. Just to clarify something further, what I hear you saying is that there is no money available from the township that could go toward assisting city of Bloomington residents who were affected by the flood. Is that right? Again, I will reiterate that you have, you the board have the ability to make a decision on the general town fund program. However, based on guidelines that I've seen from um, the Illinois compiled statutes, that we have um, that we have that set up for COVID because the president has allowed, I mean, the guidelines have allowed us to do that because the president declared it a national disaster. Sure. I, so, I, and so I don't, I don't have that answer and I can talk to and find out from the attorney specifically if you can just use those dollars despite what I'm saying. But I believe that that it's in the best interest of township not to, but I'll get the exact information from this uh, township attorney on that just to make sure I'm clear on what I'm saying. Sure, I, I appreciate yeah. that. And I don't, I'm not disputing no, I know, what I know. you believe I, or, or it, that it's correct. Right. I'm just trying to clarify because at last week's committee of the whole meeting, there was some conversation that we ought to use up any available funds from township. Um, before we would even consider making any any um, offering any assistance to people who mm -hmm. um, were affected by the floods. Well, remember, so, township is not a home rule, you know, like the city municipality. Right. So we, so we I'm have just to follow trying, whatever the guidelines show. So I'll just clarify the guideline, make sure that the Illinois compiled statutes are saying what I'm saying, and then and then we'll, I'll get back to you on that. So I don't really. So could I finish my, my sure, sure. I'm, I just want to make sure I'm understanding that at this point, you're not aware of any township resources that we could tap into to provide assistance to people affected by the floods. Correct. Thanks. That's, that's all I wanted to Outside clarify. Outside of maybe administrating right, that one. Right, right. Yes. Which could be very helpful. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Sorry okay. I interrupted on that. That's okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Um, Deb, do you have anything else to add? It is. Um, cemetery walk is coming up. Okay. And I cannot get tickets this year. They've done something different. I've tried. Mm -hmm. So I, it might change next year, but this year they're not doing that. I'm sorry about that. But I did work on your behalf to try to find tickets. Blame the pandemic. Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Anything else, Deb? No, thanks. Okay. Uh, so next, we'll have a report from uh, Township Assessor Steve Scudder. Good evening. Um, 
we turned in the assessments uh, a couple weeks ago and they were published in the newspaper on Friday. Um, the, the report I gave you is showing where the EAV has, what we submitted to the county at this time, as we have seen an increase. And then I sh showed the exemptions that we had the previous year of the effect on the total EAV and the minus the exemption, how it affects the amount of the EAV that's taxable. Uh, as we're going into the border review season, uh, we made adjustments to a lot of properties in the city. And uh, the main thing that uh, if someone feels that their property would not sell for the market value that we have placed on their property within a reasonable amount, uh, they should file the complaint form through the county website uh, at the Board of Review. Uh, on that website, if they fill out the form, complaint form within the 30 day time frame, uh, they'll receive a email notification saying that they have received their complaint form and will process through the regular um, Board of Review review period. And So these, these numbers are typically high when we deliver them now, but by the time the end of the Board of Review, there's usually a reduction based on the amount of complaints from the taxpayers in the city. So um, the, the, the time frame is October 25th is our deadline to file the complaint. If anyone has a, something that they need to bring to our attention and uh, we'll work through the Board of Review and that all process will be done by the end of the year. Okay. Sounds good. Any questions for Steve? Okay, seeing none, uh, we're going to move on to public comments. Madam Clerk, do we have any public comments? We do not. Okay, thank you. Um, so is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. All right, township is adjourned. See you in about 10 minutes.
-hmm. Okay, if everybody can settle in, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. Okay, thank you. The time is now 6.01, and I'm going to go ahead and call to order the, me the meeting of the City of Bloomington uh, Council. Um, and if everyone could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Thank you. Madam Clerk, could you please go ahead and call the roll? Councilmember Bolin? Here. Councilmember Montney? Here. Councilmember Emig? Present. Councilmember Becker? Here. Councilmember <clears throat> Ward? Here. Councilmember Crable? Here. Councilmember Crumpler? Here. Mayor Miller-Wombly? Here. Uh, next item on the agenda is recognition and appointments. Madam Clerk. We have none for this evening. Okay. I thought we had, didn't we have some appointments though? Oh, yeah. okay. Yes. Sorry. So no recognition. Okay. Thank you. Got it. Sorry. Uh, next item on the agenda is public comment. Do we have any public comment? We do. Uh, we received one emailed public comment from Greg Coos. And we have three people uh, present and let's see here. Um, we did have one person register, uh, Matthew Tosco to speak remotely. Mm -hmm. um, however, he is not present online currently. Okay. So if we move forward with our in-person, uh, the first one up would be Greg Coos. Okay. Um, so public comment is an opportunity for speakers to provide their views and feedback to the city council it is also an opportunity for the city council to listen and hear diverse points of view. To maximize the impact of public comment and show respect for the expression of all views, speakers should maintain civility and focus on city issues. Speakers must identify themselves for the record, but are not required to give their address. Each speaker is given the floor for three minutes and the council does not respond or engage in debate. Any speaker that engages in threatening and disorderly behavior will be deemed out of order and their time ceased. Thank you. For, <clears throat> for reasons of clarity, I am removing my mask. I am Greg Coos, 305 Woodland Avenue in Bloomington. I'm going to speak about historic preservation and a historic preservation plan. Uh, in this, I will cover preservation, economics, climate change, and equity. Tax base is an important part of historic preservation. The plan Bring It On Bloomington presents data on the central city, which is a 450 square block area built in 1940. The data shows that this historic core contributes significantly to Bloomington District 87 tax base. This is because it is a densely built area and it remains today an area of high population density. Because the city has neglected for decades the true economic ec value to the community, the tax base has somewhat eroded. It is not reaching its capability, its capacity. But in return, its value to the city, even in the face of city disinvestment in the core, is still higher. That is the value is still higher than the heavily subsidized 20th and 21st century subdivisions, which have far fewer people living in them. The central city is a key to a healthy tax base for District 80. 
District 87 is landlocked. It has no land to grow upon. The best way that it can cover its rising costs is for the property to rise in value. As community leaders, I would ask you to work to help build this tax base. And to keep the tax base of District 87 healthy, we as a community must reinvest in the central city and neighborhoods and not disinvest. Climate change is another aspect. Our community can work on climate change by encouraging the reuse of old buildings. Climate scientists agree action in the immediate time frame, that is now, is crucial to stave off the worst aspects of climate change. Reusing existing buildings provides a means, an important means of avoiding unnecessary carbon outlays and it can help us achieve carbon reduction. There is an immediate carbon savings with reuse and renovation as compared to new construction. Reuse matters. Reutilization matters. Preserving and rehabilitating an existing historic building has less negative impact on the environment than new construction. The okay. rehabilitation of older buildings utilizes existing infrastructure, such as water we... lines, sidewalks, and streets. Okay, thank you. I think we've reached uh, three minutes. Pardon? You've reached your three minutes for public comment. Okay. I'm... So my time is up? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Next up, we have Catherine Petty. Okay. First, still working? Okay. First, I would like to address consent agenda item. I think it is item 7K, section 11E11D, that proposes to change the city manager's $550 a month travel allowance and make it a contribution to his retirement fund instead. Whether this is a tax advantage or a matching fund issue, I feel for sure it is a windfall for Mr. Gleason. It seems through this proposal, the city manager no longer needs travel expenses. Therefore, ethically, these funds should be returned to the city. Second, I would ask the council to vote against the proposal giving the mayor and the city manager power to approve agreements, contracts, and related documents. Please, city council members, do not give up your power. Do not vote for this change. Do not make our democracy an autocracy. Do not give an unelected official, the city manager, the ability to spend our tax dollars. Do not give up my ability to have my voice heard through you. Lastly, I am here again to encourage the city council to vote to move up the timeline to separate the city's combined sanitary and storm sewers. Over many council meetings, the city has recognized that there is a problem with the combined sewer system. It is essential that the separation be done as soon as possible to alleviate the water sewer problems of your constituents. Please vote to move up the timeline for the sewer separation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next. Uh, last, we have Gary Lambert. I'm not very tall, but I'm taller than this thing. Just a couple of comments on uh, item G. 
deals with uh, ordinance amending the city regarding video gaming. Seems to me that it wasn't too long ago that we just increased the number, and I'm going from memory, but from 50 perhaps up to something greater than that, 60. And now we're proposing increasing it even more and more dangerous, and I didn't read all the detail behind it. We're putting the power to grant that license in the hands of a city official. Not saying it will happen, but there's certainly the opportunity for some under the table activity there. Back to the pay for play. Strongly encourage that you lead the ordinance where it's at, or if we're gonna just change them every time, let's just do away with all of them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody? There's no further public comment. Okay, thank you. Okay, next item is the uh, consent agenda. Is there anything on a consent agenda that anybody would like to have removed? Okay, Council Member Mutney. I'd like to remove G. Okay, seven G. Anybody else? Oh, Council Member Emig. I would like to remove N simply because I have to recuse myself. Okay, seven M. Oh, N as in Nancy. Okay, sorry, I heard M. Okay. Okay, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item 7G and 7N as in Nancy? I'll make that motion. I'll okay. second. Okay, motion by Council Member Bullen, second by Council Member Crayville. Madam, oh no, we're voting. Right. <laughs> yeah, we're not calling the roll. I voted accidentally. I was still in township mode. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're okay. I've actually removed it. So we're okay. how will I get awesome. that there? Um, if Council Member Bolin, Council Member Emig, and Council, uh, let me see, uh, Becker could actually, I'm sorry, not Becker, uh, Montney could please refresh. Okay, so the item consent agenda passes are no nays to announce. Okay, so next on the agenda is uh, item 7G, Council Member Montney. Thank you. So this particular request is for us to amend the video gaming uh, ordinance to enable discretion when there is a basis for using the lever of a gaming license as a part of economic development. Um, in effect, it does allow for expansion of video gaming in um, conflict with the current ordinance as it's been written. And it's my understanding a tremendous amount of thoughtfulness was put into how the current ordinance was constructed. As it stands now, the video gaming terminals that we have in Bloomington is and has been persistently in the top 10 of all communities in the state of Illinois. To say they are popular would be an understatement. Just year to date, $190 million has been placed in these terminals with a significant loss to the residents in the gaming process and in turn netting the city $775,000. I bring this up because I believe that the lever of gaming and the revenue generated by gaming 
is perceived to be something that is very significant as a windfall to local government. Um, however, if you do research and just look at recent articles written in the state of Illinois, many cities are already layering on additional taxes for the fact that they don't believe the revenue that they're allowed 5% with over 30% going to the state is enough to cover the challenges that their communities are facing as a result of these gaming terminals. In our own community, one of our homicides this year was a stabbing that took place directly after uh, someone was seen winning some money, I believe $400 as a result of video gaming and he was then killed shortly after by someone who I'm told followed him out of the establishment. So I'd like to pull this for a few reasons. First of all, I believe we have enough. This is not a top 10 list that I believe we should aspire to be on. And again, most of the revenue actually goes to the state and to the terminal owners. Most of them, and most of the money actually leaves our area. And it's not just the loss of that money, it's the opportunity cost in this year, $15 million that has been lost. But if you look back to the preceding three year window, it's 50 million that has been lost by people in our communities. Um, furthermore, if we situationally allow staff to negotiate with this as a lever for commercial development, even when the council would still have to approve those one off, I believe we are disadvantaging those who are on the waiting list who have followed the processes that we have in place, processes that require a 12 month incumbency in a location before the licensing process can begin. Being asked to extend licenses as a tool for development is something that would impair transparency and could be perceived as unfair and us discretionarily or subjectively um, varying from what our stated process is. Finally, in my research, I noticed on the video gaming license holders by ward, a disproportionate number of our video gaming terminals are on the south and west side. I bring this up because there's a significant amount of industry research that shows those who least can afford to bear the losses are negatively impacting by this particular type of gambling the most. This is one of the most regressive forms of taxation there is. Uh, that's why I've asked to pull this. I believe our existing ordinance is sufficient and that we don't need to modify it to expand it. I do understand that a commitment was made previously prior to my election with regard to an existing business that exceeds this cap. And rather than amend the ordinance for something that was inadvertently done, perhaps to their um, belief, I believe that should be evaluated and handled separately. Okay. So are you making a motion? I would like to motion that we not move forward with voting on this and that we maintain the ordinance as it is. Okay, is there a second to that? Okay, second by Council Member Becker. Any additional discussion? Yes, uh, I'd like to ask Alderwoman uh, Motney, there's also a provision in this um, a proposed ordinance that allows for transfer of ownership, which is different than what you spoke about. Do you oppose that as well? So as I read the transfer of ownership, it seemed like, I'm gonna pull this back up, sorry my screen went out. It seemed like that was already provided for in what I currently read with the current ordinance. Are you seeing that that particular aspect was not clear in the prior ordinance? There are additional um, uh, wording added to section four of the, of, of the ordinance to allow for that transfer. Um, 
And I think, I don't know if anyone from staff wants to speak to that, but I think that was the second purpose of, of that uh, ordinance. Uh, yeah, so when the ordinance was originally approved, I think it was the intent of the council to allow a transfer if somebody was buying a, an existing business and going in at that location. Uh, but the language there was somewhat vague. And so we're just trying to tighten that up to get back to what the council's, what we believe the council's intent to be. So we had a situation where a, um, a person uh, actually transferred their license to another business at another location. And so to avoid a market being created where people can buy and sell video gaming licenses, this language is designed to, to stop that. How do you ensure that the owner that this would transfer to meets all the requirements of the existing um, ordinance and application process? They, part, of, uh, part of getting a transfer of a license the person has to complete an application and has to submit that. And so that is all then reviewed and they have to be in compliance with the other provisions of the code. So for the purposes of simply changing that language alone, I would be open to that, but I don't want to be ambiguous at all as it relates to the discretionary and subjective expansion. I am opposed. Okay. Mayor, I had just one follow-up question. Sorry. Oh, I could. sure. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to ask from an economic development perspective, how much of an impact do we think it would be if we, um, you know, didn't provide this provision for economic development to allow for adding, um, adding, uh, you know, gaming license? Like what, what kind of e economic impact from experience do you think that might have? I think Alderman Crable and, and to the council, uh, the idea behind this, it was two part, uh, was going to uh, clean up the uh, existing language, but then also trying to preserve the integrity uh, and the desire of the council with the cap of 60. We do have a development agreement uh, that's in place where uh, this uh, additional video gaming license, which could take us to 61, absent the approval of uh, uh, what's presented tonight, uh, would uh, uh, be an issue that we have to deal with. The idea behind uh, staff having the uh, ability to negotiate, it is very clear uh, this past council and the work that they've done in this current council's uh, wishes regarding video gaming. Never uh, will you hear me discuss uh, the benefits of uh, the revenue generated from video gaming uh, you know, to the uh, detriment to uh, the individuals as Alderwoman uh, Motney was discussing. But I also uh, believe, or at least the thought behind this uh, was to never say never uh, in a development agreement uh, puts us in a position that uh, it might be a truck stop on the fringe of the community that they require a video gaming license in order to uh, come to the community. Uh, might be a hotel that wants to locate next to the downtown Coliseum and uh, a condition is a liquor license and a video gaming license. Uh, the video gaming itself uh, is not, um, uh, you know, the desirable enough that uh, the possibility with development investment that uh, the ripple effect uh, could outweigh that very clear negative and, and desire of this council. So it's just that flexibility and ultimately in any development agreement, it comes back to council uh, for the final approval. Right, so ultimately this is not a, a blank check. We, it would all have to come, any exceptions to add a license for what, whatever purpose would have to be approved by council on yep. a, on a one-off basis. Yes. So why stop there, I say, because, you know, when you look at our current environment here in Bloomington and Normal, four out of five terminals in Bloomington and Normal are in the city of Bloomington. I believe there would be the opportunity to free up licenses currently through better regulation of those institutions here in town who have them, because it would be difficult based on the data available 
from the state gaming division to ensure that those entities are meeting the requirements for 50% of their revenue to come from other than gambling in some of these establishments. If we have an audit process in place, um, you know, that would be something I would be very interested in looking at. But as it relates to a negotiating lever, um, that would be true for anything. That doesn't mean it's in the best interest of our community and that it's worth it. Um, we've seen in other communities, and again, if you look at the request being made now to actually add penny taxes on video gambling already going on across the state, it's because these municipalities have determined what they have already is problematic. Okay, I see no other comments. So we're gonna go ahead and... Can we clarify the, the motion? Sure. Sheila, did you wanna modify the motion to allow for the transfers, but then be what you said before? Yes, I will modify the motion to allow for the ownership changes subject mm -hmm. to the review and the compliance of the new ownership, but not to enable the discretionary use of the lever of a gaming license as a tool for subjective um, economic development. So Jeff, do you, is it better to deny this, bring back something that's cleaned up next time or? Well, because I, I usually get nervous about doing stuff on the floor. Yeah, I, so I think what I hear is we would be removing section two and section three in the ordinance, mm -hmm. which deal with the um, the development agreements and the annexation agreements, and so those would be removed under the motion. So it's basically a motion to approve the ordinance as amended, with those okay. two sections removed. But section four would stay in there, which addresses the transfer of licenses. Okay, sounds good. So is that okay with the seconder? Okay, sounds good. So do you have a question, Councilmember Bowen? Um, yeah, I just want to, I just want to share that um, myself, um, former alderman uh, painter and Bray were the ones that worked diligently for quite some time. And there was very, um, extensive debate, including what you have brought forward here. And um, we worked very hard to get con consensus. I do have kind of an issue with handing, um, handing what really belongs to the council to staff for making decisions. I mean, that's the way it appears to me. Um, I may be wrong, but... Um, I, I don't believe that liquor license and video gaming license are truly economic development, specifically when they are located within a neighborhood, like maybe across the street from the zoo or something like that, because that just circulates taxes within the city. However, if like the city manager Gleason said, <clears throat> It is a large entity that will stimulate economic development over and above video gaming. That I could support, but it needs to come to the council clearly stating that we have this annexation agreement or development agreement that includes video gaming, very clearly stated so that as a group, we can say, no, this is not a good place for it, or this is not the kind of, um, you know, maybe we don't want a nice hotel that has video gaming, that we, the council needs to have the ultimate choice and it needs to be clearly stated. Okay, Jeff, you wanted to respond yeah, to that? I just, um, so there is absolutely no staff discretion or power in this ordinance. Okay. The only way that a, what we call a contracted video gaming license would become available is if the council approves a development agreement or annexation agreement, and that is contained within that document. So that's like the Lulu's pizza, where this council approved a development agreement that granted, that said, if you know, they would be eligible for a video gaming license. 
and so the the power still rests with the council if you know if, if that proposal comes forward and you like it in, in the development agreement and you know maybe it's this grand project that that is your decision and you hold that and if you say yes it's the the benefits outweigh the negatives and you include that license in that agreement then it then only then would it fall under this and it would be at be and staff at that point would be able to issue the license but not before the council formally approves it. Okay. And I'd also like to clarify that Lulu's Pizza, I don't know exactly the timing, maybe Leslie does, but there was a moratorium and then there was, you know, somewhere woven into this was the Lulu Pizza's development process. And then the debate about the moratorium and the cap and somehow everything got lost. So. Correct me if I'm wrong, that is where the extra license came in? I'm, I'm not sure I can speak to the getting lost portion of it. Um, we, at the time when Lulu's was approved, we had a 60 license cap in the code, but we had not yet met it. So we had not issued 60 license. Okay. Um, and so I, I can't speak to what number we were at, but for example, let's say we had, we were at 57 um, when it got approved. Um, Lulu's could not apply for their license until they'd met a ton of other thresholds, which were part of the agreement that was approved by council. And um, for instance, like right now, it, it, they've got their, um, they're prepared to, um, apply for that license. But now we've met this cap, we have three people sitting on the waiting list. And so I think maybe that's what you're talking about in that in that vague sense, we weren't at 60 and you were approving 61, but you were ensuring them a license at which point they were they had met all of the other requirements of the agreement. And so uh, here we are, we've already issued the 60 that we have and they're now ready to receive it, which would then be a 61. So we knew it could potentially be a 61, but when this was being considered, we hadn't reached that cap yet. Okay. So, Council Member Monty. Yes, a, a couple other observations. Um, in terms of the scale of economic development, everything is relative. And we have three local businesses that are currently on the waiting list. And to them, on a relative basis, based on the numbers that you can see, which is incredibly lucrative for these local businesses who have these licenses, we would be saying effectively that if it's a big deal for some outside company coming in wanting to build some big development outside, uh, say the truck stop example, uh, we would be saying to a local restaurant, for example, that's been waiting on this list, that we're going to allow this for them, but you, we're not going to allow it. It's not available. I believe this proposal introduces a level of situational handling and subjectivity that could be perceived as being unfair to the businesses that we already have that have been waiting in queue. Thank you, Council Member Cribble. Uh, yes, I just wanna um, ask, so what we're doing with the contracted establishment licenses provisions um, is basically to allow for city council to uh, approve something like this. What would be the difference between, let's say we don't pass that? Right, and but we 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 bring in a, a new project, and they want a video gaming license. We can bring it to. Could we bring it to the council anyway and make an exception? You see. Yes, although I, so that's what we're trying to do with Lulu's because Lulu's is now constructed and they've applied for their video gaming license, but they're but we're at the cap. So, um, you know, we're trying to create a system to address those types of situations and, and maybe there's a better system to come up with, but knowing that the council, you know, did not likely did not want to raise, you know, to 65 licenses, this was, 
you know, this is an alternative to that. You know, we could also increase the number of licenses at any time. Um, we could we could say in here that there shall not be more than one contracted license at any given time as well. Although again, as you said, you could come back and amend, and then we could amend it on a case by case basis. But either way, the council is still involved in making those decisions and approving that. Councilmember Montney, and then uh, Councilmember Enoch. I, I just wanted to bring up something else I recall from, from those conversations in the past. There was discussion about channeling the proceeds that we gained from the video gaming to um, agencies that supported those who suffer from gambling addiction or, or have some concern. And I know that came up when we were reviewing assiduously the state, state of Illinois trying to grapple with um, the consequences. And if we are going to have more and increase this, how can we solve more of the root cause of the issue, which is less the, the activity of gambling and more what, what causes um, people to, well, to have the problem in the first place. And I, I just didn't wanna lose that part of the conversation. Um, I also maintain that in the end, it it does seem that this body would would ultimately direct the course of action, whether the ordinance is tightened up now or allowed some contextual um, decision making, or if it comes forward as part of a development proposal in the future, or um, in in future years, there's a vote to decrease or increase if, in fact, some of these gambling um, organizations are found not to be meeting code through audit. So I, I think if anything, it gives us a little more um, transparency, if you will. But I didn't wanna lose sight of, of the conversation we had about directing funds in that way. Okay, before we go too far, I wanna give the city manager a chance to respond to uh, council member Crabo. That way he doesn't, we don't forget it. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. And in, in response to Alderman Crable's uh, question about, if not this, what will the staff uh, uh, next steps be? And, uh, and actually, Alderwoman Emig uh, stole the word that I was going to use. Uh, this component of the agenda item is about transparency, uh, you know, wanting to communicate to the community that this is uh, a possibility. Uh, so we wanted to capture it in the uh, consent item. So if this is not approved, uh, I'm not going to say no to a development that potentially comes to this community. I'll still bring it to the council. Uh, we just felt that uh, this possibility, this additional uh, component to the agenda item helped with the transparency to the community that this is uh, something that will, uh, is a possibility. Council Member Monty. I'm glad that Council Member Emig brought up the issue of the redirection of some of the funds to social agencies. I mean, this issue of gambling addiction and particularly as it relates to video gambling uh, is something that's been particularly precarious. That very social challenge is why many of these municipalities are looking to add additional local revenues because the cut for municipalities on this with the state of Illinois has been insufficient to make up for the, the challenges that their communities are facing. Thank you. So I think at this moment we're ready to, to vote on Council Member Montney's uh, motion. And Jeff, can you help us out with repeating the motion? The motion is to, the motion is to approve the ordinance as amended with section two and section three on the contracted establishment licenses removed. And so it would only include the provisions on uh, transferring the licenses. Mm -hmm. And then if, if this motion were to fail, then a motion could obviously be brought forward on a different version or something. Okay, sounds good. We should go ahead and, are we ready to vote? Okay, awesome.
Council Member Crumpler, if you'd refresh. Okay, so it looks like a four to three. Ordinances require a a, um, a vote of five, a majority of the aldermen. Um, so even though this one does not have, I would say that we probably need to So Jeff, you're yeah. saying that we need five votes to approve the ordinance? Yes. But if we're not, this means we're, oh, we're approving an amended version, got it. Okay. Yes. So um, I think that this this motion would fail, would fail then. then. Okay. Um, and if there's not five votes, you know, if there's not another motion or there's not another five votes, then we can just, you know, bring this back in another form or something like that. Okay. at another date. All right. Sounds good. I, I think it's pretty clear to me, so no need to bring another motion. Excuse me. I'll make a motion. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like a motion to um, table to the next meeting, date certain, and maybe some discussion can be had with the council about wording um, so that people are more comfortable. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So motion to table until the next meeting? Yes. Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure. Do motions to table also require five votes? No. no. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. Sorry. Okay. Second by council member Emig. Please go ahead and vote. Councilmember Montney and Bolin, if you could please refresh. Okay, so 61, Madam Clerk, if you please announce the nay. Council Member Montney. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is item 7N, which I understand Council Member Emig is. Yes, I, um, the place where I work is partnering with the JCs. Okay. So I'm recusing myself from this vote. Okay, sounds good. Do you want to step outside for a second? Step out, or? yes. Okay. Don't trip. <laughs> okay, do you want to make a motion? Yes, I'll okay. make a motion to approve. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, you guys go ahead and vote. Okay, the motion passes, no nays to announce. Get back, Council Member Emig. Thank you. Welcome back. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go ahead and move on to the regular agenda. And 
We have item 8A, a consideration action on a resolution in support of the Bloomington Historic Preservation Plan as requested by the Economic and Community Development Department. And I don't know if City Manager Gleason would like to make some initial comments or? Melissa, did you have any opening comments or just turn it straight over to the presentation? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Good evening. What's that? Greetings. Uh, my name is Nick Kellogg Urisis. I'm with the Lakota Group. Uh, we are a preservation planning firm based in Chicago. Thank you for having me uh, tonight to present an overview of the historic preservation plan. Uh, as you note, uh, probably notice it's a 200 page plus document. Tonight I'm just going to give you an overview, some of the highlights in the plan, and go over what's inside the, the document. So if we go to the first slide, get that up. Okay. Okay. Give me a favor, Nick, and uh, pull the mic closer to you, okay. please. Sure Thanks. How's the family? <laughs> what can you tell us about yourself, sir? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been a preservation planner for almost 30 years okay. and uh, I've had the opportunity to work around the country uh, with communities that uh, want to uh, use historic preservation as a tool for building quality of life and economic development. And so uh, I've been with the Lakota Group for 15 years now, and uh, we're based in Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've, um, we have a uh, staff of around 18, and I have four preservation planners that work with me. And uh, so it's been a wonderful Actually, it's been a wonderful career. I've had a chance to work in a variety of communities. So, and uh, we've enjoyed the opportunity to work with the city of Bloomington on this on this process. Uh, we had very good participation from the steering committee uh, that was formed to assist us in this project, uh, as well as the Historic Preservation Commission and city staff. And so, uh, we learned a lot about Bloomington, mm -hmm. a lot of stories that are beyond Abraham Lincoln and the David Davis legacy. So a lot of interesting pieces of history and, and a lot of great architecture here too. So, mm -hmm. and uh, it, was, it was a pleasure to be a part of this project. Awesome, well, thank you. That was a nice intro, was it? <laughs> I could start okay. the presentation without the slides, I guess. <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay. yes, it sounds like it, but it, it looks like they're almost getting there. Well, maybe not. Um, so what are some of the challenges that you've encountered doing this work? Uh, the challenges is I think, um, and I think this is, cuts across almost every community we work with is trying to, um, two things. One, trying to educate and inform the community about the benefits of historic preservation. Okay. Uh, you know, I think, there's a number, I mean, there's many benefits to preservation and um, being able to kind of inform the community about what the benefits are, I think is really important. And that's an ongoing task that almost any community needs to do. Um, 
sometimes there's this fear about preservation, mm -hmm. you know, um, and sometimes there's just not enough knowledge about how uh, preservation could play a, an important role in economic development. Um, some of the tools that we have can be kind of confusing to most people. So being able to explain that um, is very, very important. And, uh, and I think the second thing is, is that it is, uh, it's an important tool for economic development, but also for bringing a community together. Mm -hmm. I like to think of preservation as a very democratic uh, process because we talk to the community about what's important to them and what part of the environment means something to them. Everybody has uh, an idea of, uh, or at least a feeling about their own neighborhoods, the downtown uh, places that matter to them. And, uh, and so going through a process like this, we get an understanding of what's important to them and then trying to find ways in which those can be preserved or enhanced. Um, so like I said, I think it's a very democratic uh, process because everybody wants their neighborhood to be uh, safe, livable, and uh, preservation plays an important role in that. Awesome. Well, it looks like we All are right. ready. We're ready to go. Yeah, ready to go. Okay. Well, from the, uh, from the next side, the, the purpose of the plan, and we, I've already kind of touched on some of these, one is, is to increase the understanding of the roles that preservation can play in community development. And it's not about preserving, you know, the famous home of a famous person, right? while that's important, but the goal is to integrate preservation on all levels of how we develop our community. The second thing is we want to advance preservation-based revitalization efforts. Uh, Bloomington is no stranger to that. Uh, you've been working on your downtown, uh, working in your neighborhoods, and we want to be able to make preservation an important tool for that. Um, as I've said, we want to integrate preservation in all levels of community planning as much as we can. Uh, business development, downtown, tourism, uh, neighborhoods are all very important. Uh, next is developing a formal heritage tourism program. I think there's a lot of places um, that are very important to Bloomington, but there are also places that people would want to come and visit. Uh, the next slide, um, enhance neighborhood livability through neighborhood rehabilitation and conservation. Uh, the next thing is a kind of a core function of any preservation plan is we want to identify new landmarks and districts in the future that tell new stories about Bloomington and its heritage. And then last but not least, we want to engage that broader segment of Bloomington and heritage stewardship. So if we go to the next slide on uh, preservation plan purpose, obviously the goal of this was to update the 2004 Bloomington Historic Preservation Plan. Uh, any community like your comprehensive plan or downtown plan, you really want to explore it every 10, 15, 20 years. You want to take a look at it because our ideas and views of history and places change over that time. And last but not least, and most important, this uh, project was made possible by a certified local government grant made possible by the Illinois State Historic Preservation Office. So we thank them for making this process happen. So if we go to the next slide, um, there is a relationship to the 2015 comprehensive plan. Uh, we are uh, advancing some of the things that were recommended in that plan. It, in the plan, it did uh, recommend updating the 2004 preservation plan. And then uh, secondly, uh, the comprehensive plan did make notion of neighborhood potential neighborhood conservation districts in Bloomington. And so we explored that concept a little bit more and in more detail in this, in this plan. And obviously uh, the, the comprehensive plan also suggested preserving and adapting significant historic buildings and encouraging the increased use of economic incentives for historic properties. So if we go to the next slide, just to give you an overview of the planning process, uh, we started in uh, November, 2019 um, with phase one. There were just two phases to this process. Phase one was the opportunity to uh, talk to the community. Uh, we had a series of focus group meetings um, in, in 2020. We got them in just before the pandemic started, which was good. Um, so we had a, a good, uh, we had a wonderful week here that we spent in February, 2020, uh, talking to a variety of different people about preservation. 
Uh, we also did an online community survey and we assessed what are the key issues and challenges. And that was summarized in a state of the city report, which is kind of the first part of this preservation plan, which was delivered in September of 2020. And then the second phase started soon after in which we uh, developed the draft preservation plan. Uh, and we completed that in March of this year. Uh, we had a steering committee meeting and as well as a meeting with the Historic Preservation Commission to uh, fine tune the plan and then to develop this final document that you see in front of you tonight. So if you go to the next slide, uh, just to give you the overall organization of the plan, uh, there are six main parts. Not to go into gr uh, too great detail, but there's an introduction and background in which we discuss the major issues and challenges for preservation here in Bloomington. We have a section that uh, summarizes the key historic resources. Uh, then we have a section in here on city planning and program administration. And that section discusses how your program here in Bloomington is administered by the city and who are the other preservation partners. Uh, then we have a section, the community speaks, which is a summary of our community engagement work and what the community said to us. And then the last two parts is the community preservation plan and an implementation section. So that's the plan in a nutshell. If you go to the next slide. On the historic resources, uh, we do, as I've said, we do have an extensive chapter that summarizes your key historic resources. And just to give you an overview of what those are, uh, one, you have a National Historic Landmark here in the community, uh, the David Davis Mansion. National Historic Landmark is the highest national uh, designation uh, any property or district can receive. Just as a note, uh, National Historic Landmark District is just honorary, places no restrictions on property, but it is a national level recognition given by the Secretary of Interior. And then there are 14 properties individually listed in the National Register of Historic Places and four districts that are listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, that is also a federal level program. It's just honorary. However, when you designate a downtown or a commercial area or an income producing property as a National Register uh, or listed in the National Register, it does make them eligible for significant tax benefits. And last but not least, uh, the most important thing is uh, you have 38 properties that are designated S4 local landmarks and three districts designated S4 historic districts. Those are designated city of Bloomington landmarks and districts and where there is um, a certain amount of control over demolitions and what can happen to properties in those areas. So that's the summary of your historic resources. If you go to the next slide, the community preservation plan uh, basically in a nutshell has five planning themes, which I'll go over in a moment. There are 12 planning goals, and then there are what we call 45 opportunities. These are types of activities that the city can undertake, can also undertake in partnership with other organizations and entities here in Bloomington. So if we go to the next slide, just to give you a quick overview of, of the highlights of these of goals and themes. Theme one is, is about protecting, preserving the next generation of Bloomington landmarks and places. Um, and really this theme is about where are the next landmarks and districts in Bloomington. And so we have uh, three goals. One is to pursue an ongoing understanding and documentation of Bloomington's history and architecture as a basis for preservation activity. The second goal is to prioritize significant historic resources for designation and preservation. And goal number three is to preserve cultural landscapes and special features of historic places. And when I talk about cultural landscapes and special features, these are your parks, your open spaces, elements of your uh, historic districts uh, that are not buildings, but are important to understanding Bloomington's heritage. So if we go to the next slide on theme one, the key opportunities, and again, these are just highlights. It's not everything in the plan. Uh, what we recommend here and in the plan we have extensive uh, recommendations on where to survey. The only way we can understand what are the next generations of landmarks and districts is to survey and document your neighborhoods. As history has moved on, we are not only looking at what is what was designed and built in the 1920s and 30s, now we're looking at places that were designed in the 50s and 60s. So for me, I'm National Register eligible myself. So, um, so we're looking at those places and, and trying to get an understanding of are they worthy of preservation? And then obviously to designate those local landmarks and historic districts, 
There is a need to update older National Register Historic District nominations because they're old. Uh, they need some updating and properties change over time. And last but not least, we need to make survey data more accessible to the public. Uh, when we do surveys, um, it provides uh, a broad base of information for property owners to understand about the history of their buildings. So to make that more accessible online would be really important. And most communities today are moving all that information online anyway. So if we go to the next slide, and this is a, a map of, and not to go into too great a detail, but this is a map of where there could be future survey activities. Um, it's not meant to be done overnight. Um, these are places that I think in partnership with neighborhood associations or other groups, the Museum of History, um, these can be surveyed and documented. There are grant resources to do those types of projects out there. So lots of opportunity for that. We go to the next slide, theme two is about, uh, theme two is all about how do we make preservation uh, more of an economic development tool in Bloomington. So we have three goals there. One is to support downtown Bloomington's revitalization through preservation and adaptive use opportunities. Goal number five is to encourage the reinvestment and conservation of Bloomington's traditional neighborhoods. And goal number six is to promote the economic and environmental sustainability benefits of preservation and community development. So if we go to the next slide, just to give you some of the key opportunities here, uh, retaining your ongoing funding for the Funk and Rusk facade grant programs. Those are key tools here locally to help encourage uh, rehabilitation. So all we're recommend, recommending there is to continue those programs, continue funding for them, because it is your one tool to bring the private sector to the table to make things happen. We do recommend developing an adaptive use program um, and what that is, uh, it's similar to what other communities are developing in which uh, we want to streamline development review, maybe provide some special incentives, um, adjust building codes to try to make adaptive use more feasible here in Bloomington. Number three, uh, organizing a neighborhood Rehabarama Reha event. Um, this is something that we've seen other cities do in which uh, a neighborhood can take a property, work with the property and work with the property owner and rehab the building, rehab the property and sell it, but also making it a special event out of it. And this is something that Dayton, Ohio, San Antonio, Texas has developed and has worked very, very well. And last but not least, explore new incentives and financial programs for historic housing rehabilitation. So if we go to the next slide, I just have a couple more. Um, the third theme is enhancing the local preservation program. And this, uh, pertains to um, the city of Bloomington and how it implements its program. There are two goals. One is to undertake updates to preservation codes and ordinances and adapt new preservation tools to help protect Bloomington's historic resources. Goal number eight is to integrate historic preservation policies and initiatives and other community planning efforts. So if we go to the next slide, um, some of the uh, key opportunities uh, in the plan, we do make some suggestions of where the preservation ordinance can be enhanced and strengthened. Uh, we do recommend updating your design guidelines for historic districts and landmarks. Uh, number three, and again, this uh, came out of your comprehensive plan and we explored it a bit more, is consider a neighborhood conservation district program. And uh, many cities uh, across the country have that. It is a different version of a historic district in which we try to encourage reinvestment in those neighborhoods. And last but not least, we integrate surveys and preservation policies and community planning activities. So if we go to the next slide, uh, theme four is about telling Bloomington's heritage narrative. Uh, there are wonderful stories here in Bloomington um, that need to be told. Um, you have great partners here um, with the Museum of History and other entities that are doing very much to kind of tell that narrative. But we have two goals. One is to use education, placemaking, and outreach activities to tell the full Bloomington history narrative. Goal number uh, 10 is to celebrate Bloomington's history and culture through engaging in exceptional heritage attractions. So if we go to the next slide, uh, some of the uh, opportunities that we suggest is creating a historical marker program to identify and, and recognize some of your important buildings. Uh, there are new partnerships we think that could happen between many different entities, uh, your neighborhood associations, the universities, the museum in which we can bring everybody to the table to 
uh, do education and heritage-based um, activities. Uh, third, three, implement heritage-based placemaking and public art efforts, and then developing a more formal heritage tourism program. You do have here uh, heritage assets here that people are wanting to come and visit. And so we think there needs to be another step in that, another level of thought of how do we do uh, a more coordinated heritage tourism program. And last but not least, theme number five is about building local awareness and capacity. As I mentioned in my initial remarks, one of the challenges in preservation is trying to increase awareness of the benefits of preservation. And so we have two goals there. One is educate the community about Bloomington's preservation benefits through innovative programming efforts. And then number 10, cultivate the next generation of community preservation advocates. And then the last slide um, is uh, several opportunities. Uh, one is to train local developers, realtors, and bankers on the benefits of preservation. Not all of them know about the benefits and incentive programs that are out there. Uh, number two, organize and conduct preservation training and education workshops. Three, engage local youth and young adults in preservation activities. And then number four, track property values and investment in Bloomington's historic places so you can understand the economic impact that is happening with preservation in your, in your, in your neighborhoods. In the very last slide, I, I lied there, there's just one more slide. Um, there is an implementation matrix. It just kind of outlines, uh, you know, potential timeline priorities, and then uh, what is out there in terms of federal, state, local funding programs. So that's it. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you very much for wonderful presentation. Uh, at this point, I will ask council if there are any questions. Okay, council member Ward. I'm curious to hear a little more about the conservation programs that you have in mind. And could you just expand on that a little bit and tell us how that differs from preservation? Sure. Uh, to, to be a, a National Register Historic District or a City of Bloomington Historic District, you have to meet a certain criteria. And usually that criteria is kind of based on the integrity of the architecture. Uh, uh, does it, did an important event happen or is it associated with important people? Um, usually it's the integrity um, requirements that can be sometimes an obstacle for some neighborhoods to meet. So um, in other cities around the country, um, they develop an alternative program called conservation districts. These may be neighborhoods that may not be eligible for the National Register, but they have a certain amount of character to them they have a certain amount of form, there's, there's architecture there that may not have integrity, high integrity, but it's character you wanna maintain. And uh, so a conservation district is a, lot, is a, is a very flexible tool because you can decide what you want that conservation district to do. You can decide whether or not it's going to manage demolitions in those neighborhoods. Uh, the quality of infill construction, you may want to have a set of design guidelines and requirements for that. Um, and you may have requirements to preserve certain aspects of that neighborhood. It could be this neighborhood is predominantly has front porches or, you know, some character defining element that's important. You may want to manage that and what happens to those areas. So it's a lot more flexible tool. And one reason why I like it is that um, you can go to the neighborhood and ask them what they want to see a conservation district do. So it's more of a bottoms up process. And you can, and you, in most cities will adopt a conservation district through a planning effort. They may work with the neighborhood and talk to the neighborhood about what's important to preserve and maintain. And then the conservation district comes out of that. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilmember Emig. Um, thank you for the, the hi. Oh, <laughs> it's like, who's talking? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I think the report is really phenomenal. So I appreciate the, all of the work you and community members put into its design and publishing it. Um, so I, I was intrigued by the Neighborhood Conservation District Program as well. And one thing that, that struck me in this report is really understanding historic preservation is much beyond kind of just the big old house, right? That right. that a couple of, of 
people who are just mad about historic preservation, like as in really excited, um, want to go for it. But it's it's actually a process for thinking about renovation and uplifting entire communities, um, as well as as providing financial resources. I know a lot of folks don't don't realize that if if they have the historic designation, like I live in a historic neighborhood, but they don't have the S four coding, then they don't, they're not eligible for the kinds of programming that you're describing. So I think that would be um, a really great thing to do. Mm -hmm. If you could name two things that you think we should have done yesterday, <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot, but, but you know, and I appreciate the priorities that you provided at the very end of the report, but just where, where do we begin right now? <laughs> Where to begin? I think uh, um, I think if I had my if I was sitting in, on the other side there <laughs> making a decision, I think I guess to me I think the the survey components are really important. I think to start somewhere. And I heard as I entered the room today from some of our preservation colleagues that they're very eager to kind of get started on that. And I think uh, I think it's important. I think uh, it's been a while since there's been a survey done. Uh, well. I take that back. There was a survey done of your industrial properties, uh, which is a very good starting point to understand how to use those uh, those properties for economic development. But I think uh, it's time for the neighborhoods to to take another look, and certainly West Bloomington is important to try to take a look at. Um, and I think you know, just getting started on the survey part. I think the second thing to me, and uh, one thing I heard during the process uh, in one of our focus groups is. There are property owners, especially in your uh, in your commercial areas, that want to do something, but they feel like they're not being helped. You know, they and so, or they're not. You know, they're the process isn't streamlined enough. Um, and also, if we can't encourage more tax credit activity in Bloomington. And so the reason why we put in an adaptive use initiative in there is I think that's something to look at here are the ways in which we can streamline processes. Uh, can we leverage the tax credits in a certain way to encourage adaptive use to happen. Um, there are a lot of property owners um, that don't know the tax credits or are afraid of them. Um, they can be intimidating because it's a it's an application process and you have to meet certain standards at the state level. So I think if if there's a way you can have a, a way to handhold property owners um, to walk through those processes, and then finding a way to leverage those tax credits here, um, I think is very important. So those would be the two things I would do. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Kruger. Thank you, Mayor, uh, and thank you for the presentation very comprehensive. I, I just found it interesting, kind of my conception of historical preservation, but I found a number of neighborhoods, including uh, in my ward, uh, Eastgate neighborhood. And, and could you talk just a little bit about how that, like, you talked about a little bit, but like how would that work, them being, that those residents and those houses kind of being a part of this eventually? Well, I think, uh, um, you know, I think, there, there are a number of communities I've worked in where, you know, when you do a survey project, for instance, that they can be involved in helping collect data, collect information, collect photographs, you know, anything about their homes that, um, you know, that can shed light on the neighborhood. I, one of the good things that's happened, in, I'd say, over the last 10, 15 years is there, there's a lot of digital technology out there in which people can crowdsource information, you know, and you can develop a survey and you could have a variety of different participants provide information. And the more information you have, the more stories we understand or we know about the community. It may bring out some histories that we don't know and may be worth preserving in the, in the long term. And uh, I, would, I think there, if there was one thing I'd probably edit in this report is really emphasize the cultural aspects of preservation as well. It's not just about the buildings, but there are the cultural aspects. So recognizing that, and in the plan, we do have a few ideas of how partnerships get, can happen to promote that cultural heritage here. That's very important. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank okay. you. Um, 
and, and again, kind of my, you know, from living in this community, as long as I have, you know, thinking of historical preservation, I think of downtown and some of the nearby older communities. Um, but, you know, kind of thinking back to the comprehensive plan, it talked about, I think, preservation areas and regeneration areas, right? Right. So, like, how does the how does the west side you know kind of fit into this because it always seems like it's we're talking about you know maybe founders grove demits grove those types of places you know where we're talking about preservation how does the west west of downtown how does that fit in the west of downtown it's a it's a it's a it's a challenging question because i think i think they're um and i i really should make a judgment on it. Um, we tried our best to try to get an understanding of what the potential is there for historic districts and things like that. And there probably is potential for that. Um, there's probably a potential for recognizing the cultural aspects of West Bloomington. And so I think, I think there's probably a lot of potential for that um, because there's, you know, it's a working class neighborhood and learning about how the, those neighborhoods developed over time and the people that came there, I think that's an aspect of Bloomington's history we can celebrate more, recognize and celebrate more. And, um, and, and maybe, you know, some of those incentives that you talked about, you know, might, might you know, go to that area as well as to, right. to the Near East side. And I guess the last question is like, this is a lot of stuff. <laughs> so like, who's in charge of driving this and implementing this from this point forward? And that may not be a question <laughs> you can answer. Well, um, you know, I don't know if the staff want to answer that or not, but I think, uh, I think, you know, I think the city can take the lead, you know, um, there are aspects that the city can take the lead and there are other aspects. I think, you know, you have these great partners in place and, you know, if, if they're enthusiastic about undertaking an initiative or an opportunity, why, yeah, let them do it, you know, especially on the education aspect, you have you know, great assets here that can really take the lead on that. Um, so I think the one thing I do want to emphasize, I probably didn't emphasize it enough in my presentation is really thinking about the next generation of preservationists here in the community. Uh, Cause they'll be caretakers of our built environment going forward. And so I think that is one thing that uh, if everybody can collaborate on here in Bloomington, that would be great. Cause that's I think very important. Sure, it looks like, Kimberly, did you want to add something? Nick ended up answering it, but on the, the question of, you know, how is this going to happen? Um, we do have staff, but we also have a very involved preservation commission. And one of the next things, they're, um, they're very eager, they've already asked, um, we're going to start talking about a work plan to see what that would look like. Um, it was the, the table in the back of the plan was, was mentioned and the, the stuff to happen in the first year really is a lot. So I don't know how we would make it all through in the first year, but it does give us some way to start prioritizing. Um, there, there are a number of ways, like the survey is right up front in that. And surveys are how, as we were alluding to, like how we determine what's proper for being designated next and, and what just needs to be celebrated, but not necessarily designated because there's a number of, of implications for that. Um, so it's uh, like I say, prioritizing the surveys, it can be um, staff capacity is um, something that's somewhat fluid based on uh, things that are out of our control. Um, but uh, I've seen anything from interns to hired consultants. There's um, the, the same kind of grant that made this possible is the same kind of grant that can make future surveys possible. That is sort of one of the easier ways to do. Um, by accepting or this plan and showing support, it's giving us permission to start exploring. You'll, you'll notice throughout the plan, it says words like explore versus absolute. That way, when you vote on the resolution tonight, you're not making any budget implications directly. Um, as we have things that we can use volunteers for, or that as, as staff, we can fit it into our normal work plan. We will obviously go ahead and do, and we'll keep you updated if there are things that have significant time um, implications and definitely budget implications, we would come back and say, here's our thought. Are you okay with this council? So um, does that kind of answer? 
Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Well, I don't see any other questions. So I, I think at this point, we are going to go ahead and vote on the resolution. Oh, actually, there should be a motion first, right? <laughs> Sorry. Is there a motion to accept the, uh, the report? I will make that motion. Okay. Is there a second? Not all at once? <laughs> I'll second. Okay. Could, right. could Council we, Member Ward? Sorry, Mayor. Could we clarify that um, we're uh, approving the proposed resolution? I think that's what you guys mean. I just want to clarify sure. <laughs> the motion. Thank you. We, I am making a motion to approve the proposed resolution. Awesome. All right. Is that okay with the seconder? Yes. <laughs> okay. So please go ahead and vote. Okay, the motion passes, no nays to announce. Thank you very much, Nicholas and staff, great work. Next item on the agenda is item 8B, consideration and action on an ordinance amending the budget ordinance for fiscal year ending April 30th, 2022 as it relates to the city's overhead sewer program in the amount of $210,000 as requested by the administration department. I'm gonna turn it over to city manager Gleason for uh, comments. Thank you, mayor and uh, council. Uh, this item B and the next item C are uh, the first two of the five actionable items related to uh, the storm event in uh, late June. Uh, B specifically is about uh, the city's overhead sewer program. It's been exi in existence for the past uh, handful of years and currently funded at $40,000. Uh, we're making the request to increase that funding an additional $210,000. And that would be uh, an annual amount of $250,000 towards this program. And then uh, if this is approved, uh, staff will uh, uh, work towards uh, a funding ratio uh, and a pay, uh, repayment uh, uh, plan that uh, is different than what we currently have uh, that's been shared in uh, past uh, presentations. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions from council members or maybe a motion? Okay. I'd move approval. Okay. Motion by Council Member Ward. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Second by Council Member Crumpler. Any discussion? Okay. Seeing none, would you please go ahead and vote? Okay, the item passes. There are no nays to announce. So moving on to the next item, consideration and action on an ordinance authorizing the mayor and city manager to approve agreements, contracts, land acquisition, and related documents associated with budgeted water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure improvement projects as requested by the legal department and the public works department. And once again, I'm gonna turn it over to City Manager Gleason for comments. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is the second of uh, five items. Uh, in the council meetings, I'll share uh, this additional information. In the October council meetings, the other three items will come before council. Uh, the one uh, that's probably going to get the most attention is the um, uh, consolidation of two phases of the Locust Colton uh, uh, CSO project and um, uh, you know the um, uh, new project uh, length if that ends up being approved. But C, as the mayor shared, it's about uh, the process, uh, trying to save time. Uh, and uh, this is not done uh, exclusively uh, by the city manager. 
this requires both the mayor and I to uh, approve uh, budgeted items related to these types of infrastructure projects with the, with the mandate and requirement that I report back to uh, council at uh, the very next regular meeting on uh, any action uh, that was taken by myself and the mayor. Thank you. Okay, is, let's start with a motion first and then. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, motion by council member Boland. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, uh, second by council member Craybill. Mayor, if I could, um, also just to clarify, there was um, a revised ordinance that oh, was sure. shared with uh, staff council earlier today, um, adding the word water uh, into the definition. And so you should have all that. And so just to be clear that the motion on the floor is for approval of the revised amendment. Thank you, Leslie. So we have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? No. Okay, Madam um, Yeah, I, I wanted to make just a, a few comments. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, I'm assuming that corporate council will be signing off on these contracts too. So it's basically three people. It's not physically required in the ordinance, but that's part of our process is all of the contracts go through our contract administrator and legal department. Okay. So yes, there's okay. there would be a, a whole procurement side to this as okay. well. And the only other thing, I, I think somebody from the audience was concerned about the city manager having authority over something. Uh, we're really trying to make sure that we can accelerate the process. If, if we don't give that authority to the city manager and the mayor, we would have to have many more meetings and much longer process. So we're trying to meet your requests. Does that make any sense? Okay. Councilmember Crable. And just to add, I mean, this, um, whatever the, the mayor and city manager decide to do, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be kept up to date as, as it progresses, right? So it's not gonna be afterwards. Oh, here's what we did. Yes, yes. And trust me, I, I'm not clamoring for more authority, <laughs> really. <laughs> you know, I'd be perfectly fine sitting back, but this is just to, um, uh, and, and this is a, 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 um, a solution that staff came up with, but it, it really is meant to accelerate and respond to the needs of uh, uh, residents. All right, so if you could please go ahead and vote. Okay, the item passes are no nays to announce. Uh, next item on the agenda is consideration and action on a resolution uh, regarding housing rehabilitation for those affected by the June 2021 flood event as requested by uh, council member ward um, so city manager gleason any comments thank you mayor and council and uh, to the community uh, this is the uh, next step to uh, councilwoman uh, ward's council initiative uh, and this is in the form of uh, three options three resolution options for uh, the council to consider uh, to provide staff clarity on uh, what the next steps uh, will be. Uh, I'm going to read uh, just so that uh, the community uh, hears what the uh, three alternate resolutions include. All three of the uh, resolutions in include using uh, existing programs, uh, the state program that we've talked about, uh, the Illinois Housing Development uh, Authority, IDA, is uh, what uh, we've called it in past presentations. The first resolution directs staff to bring back an ordinance establishing a locally funded housing rehabilitation program along with a budget ordinance amendment in the amount of $250,000 to fund said program. The second resolution requires an ordinance establishing a local program to be brought back to the council at the time the state program get, uh, gets depleted 
to $100,000 or less remaining. The third resolution does not have a local program component, but does speak in favor of the state program being used to assist victims of the flooding event. Thank you, Mayor. And we're prepared to respond to any questions if asked. Okay. So do I, do we start with the motion? Is there a motion? I yes. move, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. All right, looks like we have two motions at the same time here. Okay, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to move approval of um, option A. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, second by council member Craybill. Is there discussion? Okay, so council member Bowling. Okay. Um, I just want to make it clear to everybody on the council and in the audience why I do, do not support this motion. Um, we're talking about the purpose of muni municipal government, which is to provide clean water, solid waste removal, facilities maintenance, which includes parks, street lights, municipal buildings. It's also responsible for zoning, building building regulations, law enforcement, fire protection, and to promote economic development. The municipal funding comes from property taxes, user fees for sewer, water, solid waste, sales taxes, and taxes on local businesses. The limitations, public funds can only be used for public purposes, cannot be used for private purposes, not where the expenditure of money is directly for the private benefit of certain individuals. Since public money can only be expended for public purposes, cities and towns have no right to appropriate money to persons whose situation may appeal to public sympathy. If the dominant mot motive is to promote a private purpose, the expenditure would be invalid, even if incidentally some public purpose also is served. The public purpose clause states application of tax money for other than public purpose, as mentioned, is a deprivation, deprivation of property without due process. In other words, it's stealing. Due process is a right guaranteed under the United States Constitution. The Illinois state constitution states that public funds, property or credit shall not be or shall be used only for public purposes as stated above. I took an oath to do to follow the US constitution and the constitution of the United States and I will honor that oath. Um, I think that the local funding for the overhead sewer program, which has been in existence for quite some time, is adequate support. I, we've already addressed the township. The township cannot necessarily provide funding. The federal grants and state grants actually provide more resources than what the FEMA flood insurance provides. Any administration of a plan will be very costly for staff resources. And I would ask the township, who will it do the administration and the claims adjusting? Do they have prior flood remediation on the property like gutters, grading and foundation? Do they have a sump pump? the status of the sewer lines on the private property, adequate insurance, expectations of rehabilitation beyond the FEMA. And I'm concerned about fewer expect, future expectations of residents. And also the fact that there is um, a lack of case law basically to support this. And I'm concerned about the legal footing that the city would be put on. Thank you. Okay. 
So just to, to add, and, and Donna stated a few things that, that I was going to say as well, I, I do think we have an obligation to honor the oath we took. In my personal view, the intent of the ordinances that she's speaking of are that we would not use public money for this. There, it, It's just very clear to me, I can't in good conscience do that. But I also want to stress one thing. I've talked to a lot of people about this. 100% believe that there is an individual moral obligation to help and support other members in our community. 10 to one believe that it is not the city's responsibility to fund it. So it isn't just, we here in this little room with a handful of people that have shared many heartfelt thoughts and we think that's the whole opinion of the city, it's not. Like I said, it's 10 to one what people are telling me that this is not the responsibility of city government. So I'm agreeing with uh, Council Member Bolin and just saying that in good conscience, I would be violating the oath that I took when I, when I sat down in this chair if I voted for this resolution. Council Member Crabble. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, certainly uh, within our constitutional authority, um, you know, within our, our oath of office to uh, help people uh, in our community, um, like we help them in, in many different ways. Um, and so I'm definitely supportive of option A. Um, you know, I think with regard to cost and administration, if we as indicated here, are going to be following um, what the administration is going to be doing with the IDA program anyway. There will all there will be an administration administrative setup already made, um, and um, I, yeah, I don't think, um, and I, I'm not sure what Alderwoman Bolin um, was, was saying. She mentioned FEMA, but. Um, if you have flood insurance from FEMA, typically you can get up to 250,000 in coverage or in a dwelling coverage and um, 150,000, I think, in property. So what we're what we're saying here is 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 going to be much much less than that allowed. Um, and, and and so um, oh, um, and I was just going to ask a, a question. Um, um, uh, Alderman, Alderman Matthey uh, mentioned um, two things about the amount of aid and who's eligible uh, to receive it. Is that something that will be decided as we, if, if we vote to create a plan, is that kind of the next steps? Please ask the question again. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, if we talk about, you know, whatever we set up as a city to supplement IDA, if we decide to reduce the, you know, the amount available per applicant, um, or who would who would be eligible, like um, Alder Alderman Matthew mentioned, just people that filed a claim with the city, is that something that would be part of just that would be part of the ordinance that's put forth? That's not something we decide tonight. If if this resolution is approved. Those are the next step questions that staff will have of council. Okay, thank you. Council member Montney. I have a tremendous amount of empathy for the circumstances of the terrible floods that took place in Bloomington. I've read uh, the public purpose doctrine in the Illinois constitution, which I believe does prohibit this movement. It's my understanding from the prior discussion that no city in Illinois has previously provided direct aid in a disaster situation. And I wanna stop and make sure that I heard that correctly from the prior discussion. No. I was saying that we weren't able to identify any that did or find similar municipal programs. So um, it's possible that some that some community did something and we didn't find it, but we looked and did not find anything. So no known other community has ever done this. Um, 
I found a number of um, legal analyses available as this public purpose doctrine exists in many states um, in the US. And the conclusions were drawn with examples associated specifically with disasters in many of the papers that I read. And they talked about how all of us feel a sense of empathy and want to be helpful and find an opportunity to do so. But specifically for municipal governments, the public purpose with which funds that are collected through taxation must be used prohibits the ability to do so. Um, so I share that again in reinforcement of some of the discussion that we've had and that it is documented as such in the Illinois Constitution. Further, I'll mention, even though the FEMA coverage should not be at issue, uh, but I believe the below grade coverage for FEMA is limited just to structural. Okay. Council Member Crumpler. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, last time I, I, meant, I made the point that I really strongly believe that existing funds should be exhausted um, prior to even thinking about accessing any city funds for, for aid and relief. And, and like my, my colleagues on the council, um, I have um, sympathized with, with really so many of the, uh, of the stories that have been told over the last uh, few weeks. Um, I had a question specifically about um, CDBG grants. And I wonder, um, it's my understanding that there's currently um, over uh, $600,000 in that fund. And I wonder, um, if, if it would it be possible for for a portion of those um, funds to be used to support um, families who have been impacted by the flood in concert with the IDHDA grants? Is that something that we could talk about as a council, or is that is that something that somebody could give me insight about? Actually, uh, I have the Economic Community Development Director uh, Melissa Hahn, and she was standing by for that very question. Yeah, so with the funds for CDBG, um, those are already currently allocated through okay. our annual action plan that was already approved. With that annual action plan, there's approximately about $160,000 that has been allocated to the um, Homeowner Rehabilitation Loan Program. Okay. So those individuals impacted could apply for that program. Um, as long as there's funds available. So we do currently have a waiting list, uh, but that's not to say that all of those funds would be expended. Right. So that is an, an, another alternative. That is another alternative. And uh, thank you, Melissa. Is there a yeah. deadline on those on that application when you need to apply for that funding? Uh, the application is currently online, so okay. they should be able to go ahead and access that. Um, if, not, if they're having any difficulty, they can always contact our office. Okay. So what I'm hearing you say is that you said 160,000? Approximately, Approximately. Yes. That, that money would be available for um, families to apply to do, to prove a pair structural damage, that kind of thing that have been impacted. Yes, their home. they would still have to qualify for the program. Sure. So there are those qualifying factors, uh, but that could be an option for them, yes. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, Council Member Ward. Can you clarify what some of those qualifying factors are, particularly around income levels? Because we were um, we were hoping for small business development loans, you know, the, the SBA loans, and people were told that they were not eligible for those because they didn't have a high enough income. Is that also the case with the loans that you're referring to? So those would be the HUD income guidelines, and I apologize, I don't have them in front of me. Uh, but they can be found on the website. So it is adjusted per household. Um, and so I can't really speak to the other loans and why people were told their income wasn't high enough. Um, but we do have funding uh, up to a maximum per household. So, I mean, we generally try to assist, you know, extremely low, low income, um, but but it, it's, I guess, really not as low as as some may think, but that they are on our website. I apologize, I don't have them with me this evening. Okay, okay. all right, thank you. Uh, City Manager Gleason, do you have any additional comments you wanted to make? 
Thank you, Mayor. I did have two. Under the um, small business uh, development uh, loans, how many uh, were in queue already? Is that a number that uh, we're aware of, Deputy City Manager Dias? Not for the small business development loans, but um, we, we do know to the question about income guidelines, um, we spoke to those on, on, in the meeting of, I believe, the 20th. And for example, a, a family of two could make up to $59,650. So what that means is that you have to be below that if that's what's being asked. I, I, sorry, could I just clarify something? When I was asking about the SBA loans, I was, we were told that this was a possibility, the SBA loans. That was something that, I mean, everybody was given links, tell people to apply for SBA loans. Nobody I know actually got an SBA loan. And many people in my ward were told you don't qualify because you don't earn enough. Now I understand you're not, Melissa, you're not responsible for the SBA guidelines. I'm simply trying to clarify, are the loans related to the community development block grants dependent on a person having a high enough income to qualify for those loans. Am I, am I making sense there? That, and that's what I was attempting to say was okay. that there, there are maximum income versus minimum incomes. So they are for low to low to very low income individuals versus to your point, not making enough. Okay. If you make over certain levels, then you don't qualify. This is for persons who in theory wouldn't have received those loans that you're talking about. Okay. Is that Okay. Then I just had one more mayor. So I, this this was the staff attempt to um, uh, you know just further shape this council initiative. There's been a fair amount of time that's been spent, and uh, uh, there's been a motion and a second for item A, and then uh, that uh, if it's approved, this is done. If it's not approved, uh, an additional motion. Uh, could be called. And then if we exhaust all three uh, optional resolutions, staff are back to the drawing board and it just is what it is. Okay. Do you have another one? Okay. Yeah, I, I just have a comment if, if no one else has any discussion. I don't see anybody. Yeah, the reason I'm, I'm um, moving that we move forward with item A as opposed to other items is because item A, unlike the other um, two options, moves the city forward, moves this conversation forward. Um, over this past weekend, we've marked now officially three months since the flood. The Ida program, while wonderful, um, does not, for example, provide resources, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, Mr. Tyus, does not provide resources for work that's already been done. So let's pretend that my basement was flooded, it wasn't, and I lost my furnace and I lost my water heater and I lost my washing machine and dryer like some of my neighbors just a block over did. If I haven't done any work to get my water heater going again. Maybe it's, you know, it's summertime and I'm, I'm able to take a shower with just cold water. If I haven't done any of that work, then I could apply for IDA funds to get that stuff repaired. But if any of that's begun, the IDA program isn't going to cover that. So time is wasting. We are now officially in autumn. And while yes, it might've been 90 degrees today, it's gonna start getting cold. And if people haven't already repaired their furnaces and their hot water heaters, they're gonna wish they had. And if we simply wait for the IDA funds to be exhausted before we even begin the conversation of how to come up with a program to assist people, I don't know, maybe it'll be January before we're back at this council table having this same conversation again. It is time for us to move forward and do something. 
That is why I have moved for item A. I've already spoken mm -hmm. multiple times to the public purpose question and that we keep bringing that up it doesn't seem very productive. It's time for us to stop talking and start doing. Okay, thank you. Um, Just procedurally yeah. before mm -hmm. you vote. Mm -hmm. So this is a resolution. Um, as we, we had a question about the, you know, how many it takes to pass before. This is a resolution. There's no actual uh, expenditures associated with it. That would come at, at the ordinance when we get to that, if, if it's passed. So to pass one of these resolutions, we're just looking for a majority of you up there tonight. So looking uh, most likely for four to approve the resolution, any okay. of the resolutions that are, are moved and voted on. So okay. just wanted Sounds to clarify good. that. Uh, Council Member Bowling. Uh, yeah, I would like to reiterate what um, Alderman Becker said, and that I said at a previous meeting. I have yet to hear or see anyone motivate and rally the individuals in this community to step forward and help their neighbors. Why? Do people turn to the government, specifically municipal government, that has a limited tax base? Please answer that question. Is that rhetorical? Yeah, kind of, I think. <laughs> okay. So let's go ahead and, and vote. Okay, so it looks like we have it's uh, four nays and three yays. So uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the nays? Council Member Bolin, Council Member Becker, Council Member Crumpler, and Council Member Monty. Okay, thank you. So I believe the next step is we're going to, uh, is there a motion to consider? I will make a motion to accept number C. Let's see. Second. Okay, so motion by Council Member Bolin, second by Council Member Becker. Um, is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, Madam Clerk, let's get ready to vote. Councilmember Bolin, if you can refresh, sorry. Okay, so it looks like we have four nays. And three yeses. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Uh, the uh, the nays. Council Member Crable, Council Member Emig, Council Member Ward, Council Member Crumpler. Okay, well, we have one other. Is there a, a motion? I uh, so move that we we um, go with B. B. Okay. I'll second B. Okay, second by uh, Council Member Crumpler. Discussion. Yes, uh, I have a couple questions. Uh, I was going to say, I hope not. <laughs> but, okay. no, I have some questions. Um, how can, what clarity can we get 
um, and perhaps this comes with the, um, the ordinance that comes back to us about timing of that ordinance. Um, and secondly, um, how can we get some clarity on how the, um, the IDA program will be advertised? Because last meeting, I believe, or Committee of the Whole, I asked, maybe it was in an email, I asked, could we get a link for applications? Could we get some clarity on how people can begin to apply for that? Because I understand it's on hold right now. Well, we're working through council member ward working through how we will actually administer the program is you're right it's not open at this point and those are the things that we are working through but once we do there will be a link available there will be one of the things we're talking about is do we have an event where maybe people who don't have access to internet etc cetera, etc cetera, can come and sign up similar to what we did once the flood started do we do it that way do we have it first come first serve those are the things that we're working through now once we determine that, then we will provide the information to the public as to how they can apply. Those are the things that we're working through now. And do we have a, any kind of a timetable on how long it's going to take to work through that? Because again, it's been three months now. Are we talking days, weeks, months before we are able to get that clarity? I think it's within, I, I mean, obviously for Melissa, it, it's through her, her department, but we'll be working with others to, to stand up the program. One of, I would say within a week, weeks, weeks, a couple of weeks that we will know how we're going to do it. So we could expect that kind of clarity before next council meeting. Uh, in terms of how we would do that, absolutely. And absolutely. a link that people can begin to apply for those funds. I would not say that at this point. Council Member Martin. I just have a question for our council. Given that I believe the Illinois state constitution is clear about public purpose, what potential risks are there to the city for us making a potential decision to use taxpayer money or other than a condition that complies with the public purpose doctrine. And, and I can, so a passage of this resolution would not create any, any concerns or risks or liability because this is just directing staff to prepare the program and to bring that ordinance back to the council. So I can, I can put all of that together before, the, um, before that's actually voted upon by the council but can tell you specifically and most likely if, if for some reason somebody were to challenge it, you're probably looking at injunctive relief to, to stop the program, um, that, that type of thing. But I, I can get uh, more details to you on that before you actually vote upon, would vote upon such an ordinance. So my point in asking and hoping that we would have that information now it's essentially we're voting on a resolution that says we will do this. So to vote on a resolution that says we will do this if these conditions are met, I, I believe we could be potentially misleading the public if then we come back and determine that it is in fact true that the public purpose doctrine is real, um, then what would we do? when we've already potentially voted on and moved forward with a resolution that says we will do something that we perhaps should not prudently do. So, so the resolution as written, this option B, says that, you, that an ordinance will be drafted and brought back for the city council's formal consideration. So it's not saying that it's a certainty that you will adopt a local program or if it's feasible, put more money into the existing program. It's just saying that the council is, you know, staff will have that prepared and that council will consider that at that time at a future meeting. So I would argue this, this passage of this resolution is not gonna create a liability per se against, you know, anything. It's going to be when, when we get to that next stage for that formal consideration. 
So I believe you directionally evaluated this um, condition already. Um, is there anything that you might share with us for us to keep in mind as we're voting on this? No, I, I think the discussion of the council has been very helpful. And then uh, if this is approved, we will work with the council uh, to, uh, you know, put in there the uh, what you have identified to be the public purpose. And um, that would be included in the ordinance. And then it's ultimately up to you as the council. And it will require at least five votes um, uh, to, to make that determination and to approve that. And as I said, I can uh, get in detail, more in detail with you as to what the potential ramifications if a court were to determine that it did not meet a public purpose and potentially try and give you more examples than have, have already been shared. So I have a quick question for you. you. You mentioned injunction relief. Can you... Can you explain that a little bit? What does that mean? What does the, you know, what is the, the city's role in any of that? Uh, simply stated, somebody, and there have been some, some cases dealing with public purpose on this, um, but where if, if a program was enacted, an ordinance passed, somebody could challenge the legality of it. So they would file a suit in circuit court and say, you know, maybe that it exceeds its, you know, our authority and the court could say, I agree and therefore stop the city from enacting that program or utilizing any money for that program. So that would be, you know, the type of injunctive relief somebody might seek. Mm -hmm. and, and how long does that, does that take? What to, is with an injunction, there are emergency injunctions, and then you know there it's a it's a pretty expedited process as far as a as far as a court process goes. Mm -hmm. um, although, as you know, a lot of these public purpose cases go up to the Illinois Supreme Court. So if if um, if if it truly were to be challenged, you know, one might expect it to go through the court system, which could take a while. What's a while? <laughs> What's a while? Yeah. <laughs> uh, boy, a year or more, maybe. Yeah. Okay. If it's going to go through the entire process through all the different courts. Okay. All right. And depending on how much the council, you know, wanted to fight it, mm -hmm. obviously. And, and so when that goes through, who, who fights that? Who, what's, what's the city's role? The, in... it, the city would be the defendant in such okay. a case. So we would be defending it. Yes. And that would be you? Or... Yes. <laughs> so or, or firm that would be yeah, hired that's right i have a question would that be a similar process if the city were to be sued by residents who are claiming um that the city was responsible for the damages it, they're not going to be if, if somebody was to file suit on that it would not be for injunctive relief um but yes it could be a similar process where um you know if a lower court judge rules, you know, in our favor, they could always appeal that and, and so on, correct. And Mayor, just one quick thing. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, Jeff, uh, anybody can file a suit for anything, right? Yes. <laughs> and there's many suits been filed against the city that have been found to have no merit, right? There have been many, yes. All right, thank you. Um, just yeah, you know, one quick comment. Um, the reason I'm supporting uh, resolution B is again, I think, you know, with, with uh, um, CDBG funds that Melissa described and the IHDA grants uh, out there, I think there is a, 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 lot, of, a, a lot of resources for um, community members to apply for. And, and what I like about this um, resolution is it, does, um, it doesn't ask the city staff to do much of anything until we get to a point where those funds are close to being exhausted. So, you know, we're not taking away staff time um, when they should be working on other projects that the city also has um, before it. So um, I really think this is the best option for us. Council Member Becker. So uh, just for clarification, CDBG did not need this. They can apply for that on their own. That's completely unnecessary to include that in this. They could have done it without it. Council Member Emig. Um, I, I was just going to ask, it, 
kind of the about the premise of this about whether it's it's um, conscionable or or legal better word it, in your overview of case law my understanding from what you shared with us um, Jeff was that there there is some latitude in defining the public good and I not not that you have a crystal ball and you're you're I know that every option has a potential um, consequence. There's so many lawsuits now going back and forth um, all the way up to the uh, uh, president's office. So would, would you, wouldn't you have advised us, you, you can't do this if it weren't legal. I mean, if, if it was in clear violation. So as we talked about, I think it was at the last meeting, we kind of put, put up the parameters of um, doing, enacting a program like this or pursuing a program like this. And uh, one of the things that we talked about was there is discretion, although the dis discretion is not limited. Right. And so um, trying to find out at that point, we're trying to find out what exactly the council is wanting to do, what type of programs you're looking at. And so, um, I think with this, as I said, with this resolution, you know, where we're just continuing to explore it and you're continuing to look at that option of, you know, down the road approving something does not give me much harper. But, you know, <laughs> um, to say that when we get down to the next, you know, phase where it's the formal consideration, that's where we're really gonna have to have all of our T's crossed and our I's dotted. Um, you know, this is going to give us, if, if option B is approved, give us time to have conversations with Ida to look at other things. But the more that this is related to and, and you, you define the public purpose, obviously the more defensible it's going to be. And you're right, if you get to a point where there is something that um, clearly think that, you know, it, it's off the rails and it stands no chance of of prevailing in a lawsuit, absolutely, we would, you know, have discussions about that at that time. Okay. Council Member Money, have you found any example of any communities that have used taxpayer funds to pay for disaster relief for individual victims? I have not. Okay. Thank you. All right, sounds good. It looks like we don't have any other questions. So one more. I apologize. I do have one more question. Sure. Uh, really in light of Tom's comment, um, with regard to Ida, if to council member Ward's point, first dollar payment is not available to anyone who has already repaired their property, would the gap there then present an expectation that the city step in. I just want to make sure that I'm clear and that we're all clear on the steps that are involved to getting to uh, whether or not there will be city funding available. If we already have examples that the sponsor of this initiative is aware of, where the funding sources that have been identified already are not applicable, would it be our expectation and I suppose council member Ward's expectation that we've already met that threshold? Is that a question for her? I, oh, in terms of I'm not sure I understand the question. Have we met what threshold? So I heard council member Crumpler indicate that there are other sources that we will be going to, which is why he provided support for this document. However, I also heard that we already have a known population that will be not eligible for the funding that has been identified potentially because repairs have already been um, completed. And so I, I, what I'm asking is, have we already 
are we already aware that that threshold of asking the city to step in with funding is is near us? Do you see what I'm trying to say? No, I still don't um, understand what the threshold is that you're referring to. So, um, <clears throat> Council Member Montney, I, I think um, if, as I read um, Resolution B, it talks about creating a, a program that would be similar to the IED, IHDA uh, program. So there would be, so it's quite possible that yes, the criteria might be the same, that folks who had started that um, work on, or had already completed work on their homes, might not be eligible, but that would be something I think we would have to iron out at the time. Is that is that what you're thinking about? That's very helpful, just yeah. in terms of a meeting of the minds here, because I believe that's different than what uh, Council Member um, Ward's expectations were in her commentary around this option. So that's why I bring this up, just in the spirit of transparency and making sure that we're all kind of on the same page with our common understanding. Just for clarity's sake, I haven't made any comments about this option. My comments were about the previous option. And so just want to make that clear. I also am not clear on what the CDBG grants criteria are about um, repairs that have already begun. Um, and that would need to be ironed out, I would hope. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, we can't do reimbursement. Okay. So that wouldn't be allowed if those repairs had already been made for that program either. Okay, it looks like our timekeeper has notified me that we're over time. So, um, and we did have a motion, right? Motion by Helper and Ford. Okay, all right. So should we go ahead and vote? Option B. Council Member Montney, can you refresh? I apologize. Okay, so it looks like we have four yeas and three nays. Madam Clerk, would you please announce the nays? Council Member Bullen, Council Member Becker, and Council Member Monty. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so next item on the agenda is uh, our finance director's report. As the uh, finance director is working his way to the podium or one of the uh, uh, desk uh, mics, uh, we continue to trend uh, very well with uh, revenues, uh, but uh, COVID's not over and the impacts to our operating budget uh, they're very real, and um, uh, Scott's going to uh, walk us through this monthly report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, City Manager. Um, we are currently four months into the, the year. That's 33% in, but uh, it's still early related to uh, the financials that we have to review. A um, couple of revenue categories. We only have two months going in. So our, our current position is, is sort of can be captured as this. Uh, we are trending well, but but there are concerns um, and uncertainty about the future. With our revenues, there, some of them are doing very well, but there's a lot of artificial factors that worked at work related to the, the, the stimulus packages, uh, the monetary policy with rates. You know, there was pent up demand uh, from COVID. So we know all of those are kind of in a state of flux and they will wane, their impacts will wane over the year. So um, we, we need to try to stay not too excited about the, the revenues at this point in time. And then on the expense side, you know, there is concern about our commodity prices, um, the supply chain and inflation. Um, you know, we're hearing uh, to factor in a 10 to 20% contingency and uh, capital project planning 
And then of course, you know, everyone's heard about the labor availability, availability excuse me, uh, for us and the businesses uh, throughout our community and nationwide. So these, these are some of the concerns. So um, at this point, we're doing well, um, but there, there is uncertainty in the future. So next slide, please. So the major tax revenues, um, we, we are doing uh, very well right now. Uh, again, uh, kind of those caveats related to um, the uncertainty going in uh, to the rest of the year. But I would like to highlight a couple of um, positive things that you know we will see some residual, uh, hopefully long-term uh, positive impact. Home rule sales tax. Um, the year-to-date column, the variance, shows $886,000 uh, over budget year-to-date. Now, a lot of that has to do with the factors that I just uh, captured, but we do have that, I, I've talked about this a lot, uh, the legislative change that went into effect January 1st related to online retailers. Um, the taxes that they collect as of January 1st, they need to include the local portion of those taxes, our, our home rule sales tax. Um, so we are seeing um, a pretty tremendous or significant impact from that. It could, it's a, right now we're seeing about a couple hundred thousand dollars a month related to that. So some of that is being driven um, by stimulus, et cetera, um, but that is a, a long-term um, positive impact that, that we're seeing. The local use tax, you know, skipping down the page, $137,000 over year-to-date budget. That was where, that was the category that before January 1st, those online retail tax dollars were captured. So they would, um, they would charge the Illinois state tax rate, submit that to the state, and then that would be allocated on a per capita basis. And we receive that through our local use tax um, category. As of January 1st, they are paying in specifically based on local tax ordinances and requirements. So that tax, some, a lot of that tax shifted into our, to the other categories of state and home rule. So there's been a swing up to those other categories from local use and yet local use is still trending positively. Now for a little, you know, in between kind of um, category, local motor fuel tax, it's over a year to date, $40,000, but we took that category down $700,000, the budget down $700,000 from 21 to, to 22 um, due to what we had thought might be residual concerns related to remote workforce, et cetera. So you can see that we're 4% over year to date. And you can see over in the far right column, we're 3% over for the month. So the year to date and the month to date we're trending pretty close. So out of three months, we know we're that we're in that three to four percent over budget. So that would put us on a four million dollar budget at one hundred sixty thousand dollars over. But we lowered the the budget year for the year down by seven hundred. So we'd be looking at a five hundred thousand dollar reduction over prior years when we when we increase the local motor fuel tax. So that's a category um, that hopefully will will bounce back. Uh, but we need to keep our our eye on that one. Um, you know that obviously impacts our asphalt and concrete fund and the activities there. Uh, food and beverage though, uh, $252,000 over year to date. You know, another indicator of the strength of our local economy. You know, we're hoping that uh, the labor situations uh, won't be driving uh, that, that category down. Um, so, but as of now, th that's that's very good number, a very good indication of how strong our local economy is doing. Next slide, please. Oh, other way. <laughs> there we go. Um, I wanted to spend just a minute uh, going over the format of this report. This is the general fund income and expense um, uh, exhibit. Um, the general fund is our general operating services. And you know, the enterprise funds are the specific services that have specific fees for those services. General fund is driven primarily by taxation and service service fees, you know, police, fire, all the general services of the city. It's, it usually uh, attracts a lot of focus. It's usually the largest fund for all municipalities. So the organization of this exhibit, we have a revised budget column now because we've done some bu budget amendments for the year. I wanna highlight, you can see use of fund balance right now is at 6.5 million. At the beginning of the year it was two plus million related to the use of reserves for the public safety pensions. We have restricted reserves still for those. And then last month, uh, council approved a $3.2 million budget amendment related to uh, the capital equipment lease, transferring borrowing to um, cash. So that use of fund balance went up by three, three plus million over prior month. 
Now, if you look down in that cap column to the capital expenditure line under expenses, you can see that, that we're now at $3.7 million. So that went up plus $3 million. So up revenues for the, the budget amendment for a use of fund balance related to the capital equipment lease, up in the expenditure category for um, those, those equipment purchases. Then we have year-to-date actual and then revised budget remaining. So that is just the delta between our budget, our total budget, and where we are year-to-date. And then we have a calculation that shows the percent of the budget used. So you can see right above that gray box, above the percent of a revised, but revised budget used, annualized trend is 33%. This is not a perfect statistic. We're four months through the year. It's one third through the year. We do budget our revenues. We seasonal seasonality, uh, we have schedules on those. So on my uh, on the uh, major tax revenue exhibit, those year-to-date budgets are based on seasonality. When we look at the whole fund though, we're just, it's we can't do that for every single account. So we, we, we show this trend, this 33%, it kind of gives a little guidance on where we should be or a way to describe variances. And then um, the next column is the prior year-to-date actual so that we can look at variances year over year and try to explain those. Why are we up? Why are we down? Well, COVID had a material impact on 21. So a lot of our, our variances from year to year are gonna be driven by COVID this year. And in other years, it, that can be a significant or very, I guess, um, visible way of seeing what's going on with the finances of the city. So as of now, you know, the revenues are, are trending well. We've just went through the major tax revenues. Um, our charges for services are trending raw, so uh, no no material comments there. And our expenditures, same story. Um, you know, you can see salaries and benefits right at our trend. And what's material about that is, you know, we build in a vacancy savings offset into that category, and that was two million dollars. And and we have a lot of vacancies in the city. We're we're, we're being challenged to find uh, people just like all the businesses uh, in the community and the nation. Um, Commodities and contractuals are tracking well, but that's a category that we, we have to keep an eye on related to inflation and just rising commodity prices, the supply chain issues that everyone's been hearing about uh, and the workforce challenges. Um, in the year-to-date column, if you go all the way down to the bottom, I reorganized the, the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act funds um, to kind of make it correlate better with the prior year. So you can see, you know, we have um, current activity, which is just the net between revenue of 39 million and expenditures of 33.6 million. So that's 5.5 encumbrances. Those are expenses that we have POs on. So we're backing out the 2.1 million. And then we're gonna assume that we're gonna utilize all the American Rescue Plan dollars that are captured up in the, in the revenue line items. And so then we have a net activity year to date, favorable, unfavorable, is 3.2 million versus last year it was a little over $4 million. Last year it was lower because of the impacts of COVID going into the year um, and the revenue challenges that we had. So all in all, uh, general fund is, is, is tracking as expected. Um, and again, just that caveat, you know, that we need to watch those expenditures. Next slide, please. Enterprise funds. Uh, again, enterprise funds are those funds that have dedicated uh, fee structures. They're separate you know, I refer to them as business units from my private sector days. Um, the revenue line at the bottom, you know, primary focus, you know, we're 33% in, we're trending um, better than that with um, across the board, 35, 34, you know, percent, you know, to highlight here, golf is at 61% and compared to last year, they were at 54%. We have to do that comparison to kind of give um, some context to that revenue line because their, their revenues are very seasonal, seasonal. So, you won't, you won't see that one third of the year revenue as you do with the inter other enterprise funds. Um, we have significant capital projects uh, budgeted for our enterprise funds. So not to repeat myself too much, but um, you know the primary concern and, and the thing we need to keep our eye on and our budget manager, Chris Tomerlin, you know, component of his monthly budget meetings is to you know, you know, get a pulse on you know, how we're doing as, as far as those projects and, and whether or not uh, they're, it's looking like they might be um, coming in over budget, the ones that have started, et cetera. So that's really kind of the, the theme I'll, I'll end with is overall very current, currently very positive, um, just that future uncertainty um, related to rising expenditures, the changes in monetary policy, 
uh, things of that nature. So I'll pause and see if there are any questions for Council O'Mara. Questions? Council Member Kruber. Just a quick comment. I did not see this on 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 this uh, web page, and it just would really help if yep. we could see that on our screens because it's really hard to see those numbers. Yes, there. I know it's hard to. No, 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 Councilmember Kribel. Uh, I wrote a note when I was sitting there. I'd forgotten to send it the PDF to IT to have them post it it's tonight. So no I own that one. That's me. So yes. Other questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you so much, Scott. Okay. All right, next item on the agenda is uh, city manager's discussion. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, first slide, please, Catherine. Uh, downtown uh, Farmer's Market, only uh, five outdoor markets left. Uh, Melissa, her team, uh, Samantha and uh, Catherine Dunlap, they just do a tremendous job. Next slide. Downtown Bloomington, October 1st, this Friday, craft beer, food trucks, live music, uh, brew gala. And next slide, please. Trick or treat, uh, costume and masks encourage. Uh, this is October 29th, 5 to 8 p.m., another downtown event. Next slide. And then this one, wanted to share this. Uh, two, not yesterday, but uh, the Bears game a week ago. Our honor guard, our police honor guard, uh, you know, uh, brought the colors into the stadium. And I just wanted to uh, share that update. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody caught that uh, in the game, uh, but it's quite the honor. They did a great job. Do I have any more slides, Catherine? Uh, two additional comments, um, uh, soon to be Chief Jamal Simington uh, will be sworn in and officially starts this Friday, October 1st. Uh, there will be a ceremony at our next council meeting on October 11th, but excited to uh, get him on board. And uh, uh, Colonel Simington uh, has done a fair amount of uh, onboarding and uh, prep work. Uh, so uh, excited to uh, get him on board and a member of the Bloomington Police Department. And then I'll share also, uh, I have not provided a COVID update uh, recently, but something uh, that we're currently working on internally, with the mandate that came out of the uh, governor's administration, we have a group of employees and it's our fire department because we require the MT uh, uh, certification. They're now mandated, if not uh, vaccinated, that they have to test twice weekly, and it's something that we're working through as staff, the potential for uh, more to come to be imposed on this organization. But the uh, tests, the availability uh, is a challenge and they're quite costly and uh, considering uh, alternatives uh, to that and that's uh, potentially incentives. You see other uh, communities doing, uh, finding that uh, that could be justified and in the long run, uh, far cheaper than the uh, twice a week uh, testing requirement. So just uh, that quick uh, COVID update. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you. And uh, under Mayor's discussion, I just wanted to uh, express our condolences to uh, the Jelani Day family. You know, it's been a, a high profile case that has got garnered a lot of attention locally. And to, to that extent, I, I'm very appreciative of uh, the fact that the BPD held a press conference that provided as many answers as possible uh, and that they do remain involved in the case. So I just wanted to, uh, to mention that. Um, just an update on the Ward 6, 6 vacancy. I was hoping to be able to bring a candidate uh, uh, you know, today, uh, but I'm, I'm unable to at this time. And I'm, I'm basically trying to find a candidate that would have the, the broadest amount of support possible, not only with the council, but also uh, the ward and the community, because I know, um, you know, the decision that we will make uh, will have an impact beyond the ward. So that's what I'm I'm kind of trying to uh, to work towards. Uh, it's proving more difficult than anticipated. <laughs> and so there's a need for more reflection. So I would just say, stay tuned and thank everybody for, for their patience. Um, 
other things, I, I was invited to uh, uh, say a few words at a couple of events uh, this weekend, the NWCB Freedom Fund Dinner, and also the installation of uh, Dr. Tim Harris, who is the, uh, the uh, newly installed uh, pastor of uh, Mount Pisgah. Uh, so it's a fairly significant event for them because it's been three years uh, since uh, the uh, the former uh, pastor who unfortunately uh, passed away, Frank McSwain, uh, was leading the church. Uh, so it's a church that we've you know we've had uh, partnerships with and you know, very good to work with. Um, and last thing I wanted to mention is that I'm looking forward to the ribbon cutting for a ceremony for Ferrero which will be on October 13th. Uh, and I know uh, both Ferrero and the staff have worked very closely together and that, that day is near us and it's, it's gonna be very exciting to have a, a chocolate factory in town. <laughs> That's awesome. And with that, I will turn it over to council members for any discussion. Okay, council member Bowling. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to announce that um, mental health Awareness Week begins on Sunday, and um, the McLean County Behavioral Health Council has a virtual forum on Tuesdays beginning October 5th and going through November 9th. Um, there's more information and a registration on the McLean County website at mcleancountyill.gov slash 1498 slash events. So I would recommend that if you have the time that you attend the virtual um, webinars, they are very informative. You'll find out what's available in the community for people that need mental, mental health assistance, whether it's um, personal, family. So thank you. Councilmember Becker, just to add to that, I, I want to encourage everybody. If you aren't familiar with those topics, take the time to listen because if you haven't been impacted by mental health issues in some way, shape, or form in your life, you will. So please, please do take advantage of that. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I don't see any. Oh, Councilmember Emig. Um, just going back to the very beginning of this evening when Deb Skillward described the cemetery walk and that we, we didn't have complimentary tickets this year because we had um, significantly limited group numbers just to keep everyone as safe as possible. Uh, but there might still be a few tickets left for next weekend. And we are offering a virtual um, program again this year, which will be released later. So anyone will be able to have access to it. And a lot of the schools and senior centers are really psyched about that. But I mentioned it to Deb and she said, oh, be sure you tell everybody. <laughs> I said, okay. Um, a reminder that October 9th is household hazardous waste collection. Um, all that you need to know really is, is that this is a service that is provided for free. Um, and you can go to hhwmclean.org to register and get more information. Um, and last but not least, oh, see, it does that, right when you need it. Okay, I, I just wanted to acknowledge um, that last weekend, um, many young leaders were nominated for a Why I See You Service Award. And um, this is an extension of, um, well, I can't remember now. I used to think it was a different September, but I think that was in a, a former job. <laughs> but I just wanted you all to know that um, this, this award ceremony is amazing because it really highlights the, the youth in the community and what they're able to accomplish at their young ages. And I, yay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make that motion. Yeah. Or second. Okay. Motion by, okay. Is there a second? Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you very much.